Lost Women and Last Indians, Reading Island of the Blue Dolphins Reception History. When Houghton Mifflin published Scott O'Dell's Island of the Blue Dolphins in 1960, it catapulted the previously unknown author into the limelight. Today, Island ranks as the sixth best-selling children's paperback of all times and stands as one of the most widely taught books in U.S. elementary schools. Given its long circulation, it is clear that Odell's fictional narrative is the best known account of the lone woman today. In my paper, I explore factors that contributed to Island of the Blue Dolphin's popularity during the past 50 years. And I argue that if Odell's novel is to have continued value as school curriculum, it must be read differently than it has been in the past. Namely, teachers should situate the novel in a larger historical context so that children understand first that the story is an interpretation of a complex set of events occurring in the mid-19th century, and second, that the book interprets these events from the vantage point of the 1950s. As we heard in previous papers, new research has enhanced our understanding of events that transpired on and around San Nicolas in the early 19th century. But even more importantly, the narratives Americans tell about the past and the place of indigenous peoples within the body politics have shifted significantly since Island of the Blue Dolphins initial publication. The plot of Odell's Island of the Blue Dolphins is set in motion when a Russian ship manned by Aleuts approaches the lone woman's island. Having previously encountered European hunters, the chief carefully negotiates the terms of their stay. Despite precautions, however, the Sea Otter expedition ends in a battle that leaves every able-bodied island man dead. So we just heard the historical account of that. This is the narrative account in Odell's novel. In the wake of such loss, the new chief determines that the community must relocate to the mainland. A ship arrives to collect the beleaguered natives, but at the moment of departure, Karana, Odell's name for the lone woman, discovers her younger brother missing. Since a brewing storm makes delay impossible, Karana dives overboard to join the boy. Within days, however, Ramo is dead, and Karana is left to await the white man's return alone. Eighteen years pass. Karana equips herself with food and shelter and copes with solitude, in part by adopting the wild dog responsible for her brother's death. When hunters return many years later, Karana again displays forgiveness, befriending an Aleut, the enemy who killed her father, and then white hunters, the people responsible for her community's demise. At the novel's end, Karana chooses to leave her home and follow the white sailor hunters to California. Upon its release, Island of the Blue Dolphins captivated children's librarians, who awarded it with the prestigious Newbery Medal for, quote, the most distinguished contribution to American literature for children. Established by the American Library Association in 1922, the Newbery confer confers upon its winning books invigorated sales, guaranteed longevity, and frequently a place in the school curriculum. This was certainly the case for Island of the Blue Dolphins. The appeal of Island was, and is, multifaceted. As its Newbery Medal attests, it displays literary excellence, spare prose, rich descriptions of nature, and impeccable pacing. But as importantly, the novel addressed deep cultural needs at the time of its publication. Cowboy and Indian play flourished during the Cold War, as Westerns dominated Hollywood and the television screens that were increasingly becoming fixtures of middle class homes. Playing Indian enabled post-war children to reenact a narrative of American dominance in which an Indian, an enemy, might appear noble, heroic, and even threatening, but in which he ultimately, inevitably, was destined to disappear. At the same time, Island resonated with second wave feminism. After her isolation, Karana quickly realizes that survival hinges on her ability to complete the daily tasks of both sexes. Women of her tribe, according to uh, Odell, were forbidden to make weapons. But as the wild dogs that killed her brother threaten, Karana decides to ignore the taboo. Contrary to the warnings of her childhood that the, quote, four winds would smother her, falling rocks bury her, and the weapons she made collapse in her hands, Karana successively constructs and wields a bow and arrow and spear. 
For Odell's readers, presumed to be non-native, the tribe's gender taboos could be dismissed as primitive superstitions. Yet the scenario invited them to reflect on gender norms within their own culture, scrutinizing taboos that might be equally silly. For this re reason, Island of the Blue Dolphins is often featured on lists of good books for girls and was included in the groundbreaking 1971 text, Little Miss Muffet Fights Back, recommended non-sexist books about girls for young readers. Already valued for its literary quality and cross-gender appeal, Island came to be seen as fulfilling yet another curricular imperative in the 1990s, that of multiculturalism. It is here that the novel's use becomes especially problematic. Scott O'Dell, of course, was Anglo-American, and his portrayal of the lone woman and other historical actors, indigenous, European, and American, was colored by the late 1950s context in which he wrote. Moreover, it was shaped by his largely uncritical reading of 19th and early 20th century sources about the Nicolaino and European imperialism. One historical source Odell mentions in his author's note, for example, is the memoir of George Nidever, the Tennessee-born hunter, trapper, sailor, who was among the party that, quote unquote, rescued the lone woman. Nidever could not understand the lone woman's language, yet he confidently asserted in his memoir that, quote, she expressed a great many ideas by signs so plainly that we readily understood them. Nidever and his contemporaries believed they knew what the lone woman had experienced in her solitude because Robinson Crusoe loomed so large in their imaginations. An 1856 article in Hutchings California Magazine illustrates this linkage. Quote, could we but find an author at the present day with Defoe's graphic imagination, we believe sufficient facts of the lonely exile of this woman for 18 years could be obtained to make one of the most thrilling and beautifully descriptive volumes ever published. Like his 19th century predecessors, Odell imagined Karana as a, quote, girl Robinson Crusoe. And like these earlier commentators, he missed the irony of an indigenous woman figuring as such. Defoe's protagonist, remember, is an English owner of a Brazilian plantation. He shipwrecks en route to Africa, where he intended to buy slaves. Once stranded in the South Pacific, Crusoe acts as any good colonist would. He begins, quote, improving the land of which he imagines himself king. When Crusoe sails for Europe at the end of the narrative, he does so with money in his pocket, a native servant by his side, and land in his possession. Moreover, he leaves behind a group of loyal subjects who will enrich his holdings from afar as colonists. Crusoe and lo the lone woman's island experience couldn't be more different. While the former was a perpetrator and beneficiary of colonialism, the latter was its victim. And leaving her natal home, the lone woman forfeited the island's wealth to her acknowledged conquerors. Hunters, sheep herders, amateur anthropologists, and ultimately the US Navy took possession of San Nicolas Island and all it holds. The lone woman, in turn, became a refugee who lived just seven weeks on US soil. She was buried under a foreign baptismal name, and one of the prized Cormont skirts, um, one of her prized possessions, a Cormont skirt, was sent to the Vatican. Evidence of Europe's success in civilizing the New World. Karana's death does not figure in Island of the Blue Dolphins, an omission that enables the survival story to cohere. Nonetheless, Odell uses her living presence to suggest the death of her people. Before she leaves the island, Karana sheepishly adorns herself with tribal signs of maidenhood, knowing as she does so that she, quote, was no longer a girl. Karana's people disappeared, and Karana was past childbearing age. Island thus reinforces a myth central to American nationhood, that Indians vanished in the 19th century, making room for Western expansion and rendering the first white settlers of California native. Scott O'Dell was not from an old California family. His parents were Midwesterners, but his life was nonetheless rooted in the California frontier. At the time of his 1898 birth, Los Angeles was a rustic outpost. In 1960, when Island was published, it ranked as the third largest city in the nation. Perhaps nostalgia was inevitable given the transformation he witnessed. Quote, 
I would like to have it all go back to the farm, to live out in the country and raise a lot of the things that you use. That, to me, is the ideal life, Odell mused in a 1974 interview. Instead, he used fiction as a vehicle of time travel. Odell blends two interconnected literary tropes in Island of the Blue Dolphins, that of the American pioneer and that of the American savage. And Karana embodies both. This has no doubt contributed to Island of the Blue Dolphin's problematic positioning as a multicultural text, a book assumed not only to be good for girls, but also good about Indians. Yet, when we read The Lone Woman as Caruso, we impose Western ideas of individualism on an indigenous woman. And when we enfold The Lone Woman in a narrative of vanishing Indians, we reinforce the logic of settler colonialism that asserts that destiny, rather than political policy, transformed California's landscape, rendering Europeans, rather than Native Americans, the majority population. In the 21st century, then, it is critical that teachers present Island of the Blue Dolphins not only as a timeless literary classic, but also as a novel whose historical arguments reflect the context of its creation reading the early 19th century from the position of the late 1950s. By pairing Island with both the historical documents that inform the interpretation of the past and with new research about the lone woman, the sea otter trade, and imperial politics, we can help young people to understand how historical interpretations change over time and how they can always contain political and moral implications. Thank you.